but had not erupted since 1921, so it couldn't be loud and showy. On April 14, a second eruption happened. Almost immediately, the consequence, uh, uh, excuse me, almost immediately the consequences were outstanding. For a period of six days, from April 14 to April 20, volcanic ash covered large areas of Northern Europe. About 20 countries in Western and Northern Europe closed their airports to commercial jet traffic, affecting more than 100,000 travelers and creating the highest level of air destruction since the Second World War. The volcano eruption was declared over in October 2010. When I heard of this natural incident, the idea of a story immediately grew in my head. Indeed, any event can trigger inspiration. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Book Bar for having all of us today actually here. Uh, the chance to spend the afternoon with five other fantastic writers. And um, thanks to each of you also for your company on such a lovely four day. Like the five writers here today, I wrote a novel packed with suspense. Unlike them, I didn't write it in my mother language. And by now, you've all noticed that I speak a customized, a customized version of American English language. And I cannot help it, but I wear my accent like an object, an ob an obvious piercing or tattoo. And in a similar way, my accent triggers natural interest. So I thought that before reading short passages from my a novel and sharing my personal process of writing, I would introduce myself in order to satisfy your legal, legit curiosity. Um, Dan said a few things already, so um, I will just add a few, a few facts. Um, so my name is Evelyn Oling. I was born in France, in Normandy to be specific. I grew up near the coast of Normandy, just across the Chanel, you know, uh, to go to England, which I've done many times when I was young. I went to college in the early 80s, first at the university in Caen, local university, and then at the Sorbonne in Paris, where I studied French literature. And of course, if I had had a crystal ball, I would have probably studied English instead, because in 1990, just before Christmas, a few days before Christmas, I left Paris for California with my husband and our 11 months old baby. <coughs> uh, we settled in the San Francisco Bay area where we lived for five years before moving to Massachusetts, to the Boston area, where we also stayed for another five years and where again we located for professional reasons to the San Francisco Bay again in 2000. And uh, for um, all the job reasons, we moved to the central uh, part of California in 2002. And I wanted to give you a little bit of my background because, as you imagine, my non-native speaker status has complicated my writing goals. I wrote when I was young in France, and then all of a sudden, I was really far from my homeland and my native town. Um, being from another country indeed almost always means to learn another language. And the study of English is mandatory in France from a first year of middle school to the last year of high school, even sooner now, but it doesn't mean that any French kid is fluent in English when we finish high school unless <coughs> spending enough time abroad, which I never got to do. So when I arrived in California, just two days before Christmas 1990, I immediately realized that I was absolutely not fluent in English. Not only did I have a hard time to understand what people were telling me, asking me, but they also had a hard time to understand me. And in addition, each culture I quickly found out had very different ways to say similar things. For example, in France, 
when uh, people have a cold, they said they have a cat in their throat. Americans, I found out, say they had a frog. <laughs> French men wear tuxedos when they went, they go to a, an elegant evening. And I found that Americans wear tuxedos. Um, Frenchmen wear uh, smokings, I meant. Frenchmen wear, wear smokings when they go to an elegant event. Americans wear tuxedos. And then when um, Americans uh, would say, uh, don't be a chicken. I mean, for us in French, we said, don't be a wet hen. And we have the goose. You have the goose bumps. Um, and we have the hen bumps. So everything was complicated. And I found myself more than once really lost in translation. And it was funny and embarrassing at the same time. In 2013, a lot of American and English words are now part of every culture. And whenever I go back to France, which I do almost every year, I'm amazed to see how American words are totally mixed up with the French language. And younger people definitely speak English much better than we did when I grew up there. But in 1991, the early 90s was very rare to, to have this mix of languages. So um, I looked for different ways to improve my English. And by then, I had two little kids. So I found that even season Street was very helpful, making friends, of course, and talking with people, reading as much as good as I could, going to the library many times a week, listening to the radio, watching movies. But it was still really hard, you know. So. It's in the essential sets that I actually was looking. By then, I had a third little girl, and I was kind of looking to do something a little, um, taking me away of just being a mom, because I worked in France, you know. So I thought, well, maybe if I took a class without really going to school, which would be easier with my kids, and something I would learn in addition would be, would be more fun. And I started an online class. So. In the mid-90s, it was the very beginning of the online and you know, things really taking just very slowly. So I took this class, and um, it was a children's literature class. And I thought, I love to read, I love to write, I never did it in English. I will see what's going on you know, with that. So I started this class, and I still knew without with these classes that my English was far, really far from being flawless, really. And when I moved to um, the Sierras, you know, so close to where we are now, writing was more seriously on my mind. And I thought, I need to meet people who write. You know, I just need to focus on this, and I need, to, I need to meet other writers. And since then, actually, I've been part of the same writing group since this time. And I think Marie mentioned the importance of, of a writing group. And I can only, uh, only say how I think for all of us it is, but for someone like me, it's particularly crucial. <coughs> and um, all of my writing group members have published stories for magazines, nonfiction books, novels. Um, and after a few years, actually, after joining them, I started to submit my work as well. And um, I was encouraged when I sold my first stories for magazines for, for children. I won a few writing contests for different pieces. and. Um, then public radio started also to air my work uh, four years in a row. So little bit by little bit, I, I knew I was getting better. And again, two of you mentioned how what we, we, what we first do is never as good as, as we you know, improve our skills. And I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think in the same way, musicians play with musicians, athletes practice with athletes and artists. Um, uh, have, you know, workshops. I think writers need the support of all the writers um, just for the support in itself because when we, when we write, we are alone. Um, and in addition, I think we are often uh, blind to what we write. So having uh, another eye on our writing is essential. And for me, of course, it's even more important because my writing group members always notice, you know, what is a word, what is um, not necessarily proper, you know, in the sense of, of, of the English grammar, you know, the way I will build the sentence, being sometimes still in my French mode, you know, so I need definitely the support and 
um, uh, and, and, and uh, feedback of my actually writing book. So now that you know a little bit more about, about me, I will share with you the different steps I went when I wrote Trap in Paris. So as I said earlier in my opening, uh, the process of finding ideas is very personal, but for me, that was this volcano eruption. And on top of that, a personal event uh, added to my initial brainstorming phase. In April 2010, my daughter Talia <coughs> went to Paris uh, for her 16th birthday. She flew back home on April 12, only two days before air traffic was shut down. So as a mom, I was a little retrospectively anxious, thinking, oh, I'm so glad she's home now, you know? I wondered what Talia would have done in Paris if she had been stuck at the airport. But because Talia speaks French, I told her, um, and has some relatives in France, in a way, it would not have been too, um, too much of a challenge for her, you know, to stay in France for a few extra days. <coughs> so I asked myself, what if instead of Talia, it had been a teenager, from America, who doesn't speak French fluently, doesn't know anyone there. What would have happened then? And this realization initiated the creation of the main character of my novel. Cameron is 16 years old, he lives in Portland, Maine, after a week spent in the capital of France with his French club, he stayed behind to visit a distant relative of a mother, his mother but now he's eager to go home. Cameron rolled his duffel bag through Terminal A. Her way passenger slalom through Roissy Airport, either to check their luggage or to clear security. A dark-haired boy slammed into Cameron. Hey, watch out, Cameron exclaimed instinctively. The boy who stood in his way was about his age. He put his hand up but his eyes held Cameron's stare. Parfait Express said, on purpose or not, he didn't budge, and Cameron didn't want trouble. In a glance, he had assessed the boy's square shoulder bulging under his hooded sweatshirt. Two and a half years of self-inflicted weightlifting at Atlantic High had paid off, but compared to this big guy, Cameron was the scrawniest boy in the entire United States. Cameron hiked his bag higher on his shoulder. His flight for Boston was in less than two hours, and he couldn't be late. Where are you going, the boy asked. Need help? He snapped his fingers, and two other boys appeared from nowhere. In a second, the three of them had closed in around Cameron. A hand reached for his duffel bag, and Cameron jerked away. Pickpockets, he realized in a flash. Remembering the warning Madame Rigby had asked, had given the French club before they, their trip to Paris. He tightened his grip on his bag, straightened his shoulders, and without a word, pushed his way through the three boys. They mumbled a few expletives, but they didn't go. Cameron glanced over his shoulder. The boys had vanished in the crowd. He breathed a sigh of relief. Spring break was over. Visits to countless museums had exhausted him and Cameron dreamed of his, own, of his home and his own bed. He was even, even missing his four sisters. But an unusual announcement, actually, I'm sorry about that, but a sudden announcement changes his plans. Your attention, please. Everyone looked around, checking for the direction of the voice. Sudden volcano activity has been reported in Iceland, the calm voice announced. The intensity of the eruption threatens the safety of our planes, forcing us to suspend our flights for today. We are sorry for the inconvenience and ask for every passenger's understanding and full cooperation. Roissy Charles de Gaulle Airport will update any information relevant to air traffic activity. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> A mumbling of disappointment rose from the passengers master on Cameron. Elbowing and slithering, some people left the line, dragging their stuffed bags and heavy suitcases behind them. Others who had decided to wait for more information complained 
as they were shoved and pushed, many keyed in numbers on their cell phones. Soon, voices speaking all kinds of languages wrapped around Cameron. It is Cameron's first trip abroad, and he's by nature an anxious guy. And he already was anticipating trouble at the airport, and after all, his French teacher has warned them about the possibility of pickpockets, and he has already encountered them, so he's worried. When accidentally he meets Framboise at the airport, Cameron is annoyed. His girlfriend, Lily, has just broken up with him, so he has pushed girls away from his mind. But Framboise is intrigued, and despite his initial annoyance, Cameron invites her, invites her to join him for dinner. Hey, he said, what are you doing for dinner? Framboise peeked at a tiny watch that hung from her neck like a pendant. It's only five o'clock, she said, shooting one eyebrow up. I'm starving, Cameron said with an apologetic shrug. Would you like to join me? Framboise shot her other eyebrow up. I mean, if you don't have any other plans, of course. Cameron played with his cell, checking his empty voicemail, frowning with deep concentration, while glancing sideways at Framboise. He estimated a height at no more than 5'3". Since he was 5'11", he had to, she had to crane her neck when she talked to him. Why did he feel uneasy then, waiting for an answer? Framboise cocked her head, releasing the entire bunch of chestnut hair, which cascaded down past the shoulders. Oops, she said but she made no attempt to type up. Her love grew inside Cameron, but he stifled it. With girls, he just never knew what to expect. Based on his experiences with Lily and his sisters, he had deduced that silence was sometimes the best choice, if not the only option. I'd like to have dinner with you, she finally said in a sweet voice. Cameron and Framboise have, at least in appearance, nothing in common and their encounter is accidental. Yet, they become partners against all odds when, after leaving the closed airport for Paris, they witness a strange scene on the bank of the River Seine, where Framboise has convinced Cameron to spend the night to save money. Cameron buried his head in his sleeping bag. He missed his comfy bed. I better stay awake, he decided, remembering the drunk car and what Framboise had said about the riverbanks. But he was more tired than he realized, and soon he drifted away. He must have been asleep deeper and longer than he thought, because when the motors of a car woking up, he believed he was in the middle of a dream. In this weird state between sleep and awareness, he identified the car, the BMW. One of my favorite brands, he thought. Soon, footsteps echoed on the stairs, and again, Cameron thought they belonged to his dream. A fearful scream jolted him, and he sat up, heart pounding and breathless. The sound of something heavy falling or dropped into the water woke Framboise with a start. What was that, she said, in a voice thick with sleep. I don't know. A giant fish? Despite his fear, Cameron chuckled, but his chuckle tripped in his throat when he spotted a man leaning over the river less than 100 feet away from them. He was tall and strong looking in his dark suit. Cameron reached for Framboise and squeezing her arm, he whispered, Quiet, there's someone. Framboise slid back inside the sleeping bag and in a, in a few seconds had become invisible. Cameron imitated her hoping that the man, preoccupied that whatever he had done, would rush up the stairs without noticing them. Peeking above the hem of his sleeping bag, he saw that the man had his back turned to them, so he relaxed a little. He had neither seen nor heard them, but a mosquito landed on Cameron's nose. He scrunched it, twisted it, begging the mosquito to fly away, but it hummed and buzzed until he couldn't stand it anymore. He slapped his nose and sneezed. The man whirled around. Yes, he asked, switching a flashlight on. He waved it around in a few, in a few long and smooth strides. He reached Framboise and Cameron. Debout, he ordered with a kick to their sleeping bags. They both knew better than disobey, and they stood up, 
clumsy in their sleeping bags. Francoise shot a reproaching look to Cameron. The man pulled her against him. Hey, she complained. Vous êtes mal. Shut up. Although Cameron couldn't identify it, he caught a faint foreign accent. I swear we haven't seen anything, Francoise said, disobeying the man's order. It was too dark to distinguish the man's face. Cameron only noticed the shock of black hair and the anger that flashed through his voice. We were sleeping, he said. Let us go. The man grabbed his arm and twisted. <coughs> Shut up. Under different circumstances, Cameron would have fought back. Gosh, that was totally crazy. He found ways his trip to France by cleaning up after school dances for a year and offering high-tech consulting services all over town. And he was now involved in a situation that made no sense at all. The three following days filled with a cascade of events. We not only helped the police to stop a human trafficking network, but also changed Cameron and Framboise and leave the door open to, to the possibility for them to meet again. Framboise loved the <coughs> new cloth. I'm glad we met Cameron. Same here. He slipped the card she gave him in the back pocket. Thanks for Picasso. Any time, actually. I'll be in New York City over winter break. The idea that she would be in the US in only a few months made his heart beat faster, but he didn't say anything. My mom has family in Manhattan, Francoise went on. You know, the museums there are as good as Parisian museums. I've never been to New York. Cameron hesitated. I'd like to go. Even better, you see the city with new eyes. He paused and looked straight in her eyes. And I'd like to see you too. Her smile was the promise of a special winter break. Cameron looked up. The ash cloud still lingered somewhere over Europe. But the sun was winning the battle, no doubt about it. So when it comes to ideas and where they come from, for me, it's a combo between personal interests, knowledge of a specific topic or place, and of an event that triggers the desire to write a story. That said, writing remains a messy business. And the first draft is the messier, but also the most important because it is necessary to put the story down one way or another. And there is no recipe for the first draft. For some writers, it's easiest, for some the hardest, and for me, I like it best because it doesn't ask for revision yet. And it's when my ideas form and when I feel relaxed and let creativity slow and even a French word here and there if I'm not finding the right one when I write. And when the first draft on, of the story is done, then the, of course the second one is in order. And the second one, to me, is to make sure the three parts of a book, the beginning, the middle, of an end, kind of make sense with the end for me matching the beginning. If you have introduced a situation or some characters at the beginning, of course you must meet them at the end and they must have one way or another solved their problem or have changed um, in, in, you know, in such a way that the reader will feel uh, some satisfaction. And then of course, depending on the, on the complexity of the story or the writer's skills and, and experience, and just from one from one person to another, the number of drafts really uh, deeply differs. But the third and following drafts, until you feel that you are doing the best you can, to me should, should focus on, on creating scenes with vivid descriptions and sensory details involving all senses and creating dialogues that move the story and show the personality of each character. And the last one for me was is when I do something um, a little bit like applying uh, last stitches to makeup or decoration to a room. It's really checking the <coughs> verbs, getting rid of adverbs eventually and picking an active verb instead. Um, checking, of course, for me, my spelling, my grammar. Um, look for upward sentences. And I like to read aloud my own stuff because it gives me sometimes a feel of what works and not. And even better, found that 
especially for me, because I speak with an accent, having um, uh, one of my writing friends, you know, reading for me, gives me a sense of, of what flows or not. So when Trapped in Paris was completed, I need to make sure this manuscript was as polished as possible. And again, my writing group helped me tremendously to shape the story, two of them especially. And then a copy editor went through my manuscript to check anything that was uh, uh, unclear, mostly unclear. By then, it was not really misspelled or grammar, but definitely uh, sentences you know, that could have been uh, in, uh, expressed in a, in a clear way. Um, since I moved to the US, I've learned many, many things. Being away from your native um, country, what is familiar, is, is really uh, uh, an amazing source of, of, of discoveries, of course, you know. Um, but two things I, I think I am taking from my uh, American education is um, being an entrepreneur, although it's a French world, is very American. And don't be afraid to be different is also to me very American. So based on these two little things I learned, I decided for this book to independently publish it. And um, I carefully looked at the future changes coming in the publishing industry. And in Paris, I worked in a publishing company. So I knew a little bit about the business there and decided to leap ahead and to follow a path that I thought, thought was not, had, had not been trodden too many times before. And initially I was concerned with the amount of work that it would be involved, but in the end I decided that I would apply <coughs> this American thing and just do it. Um, the publishing industry has indeed tremendously changed uh, since you know, my arrival in the early 90s definitely all over the world has changed tremendously. And I think one of the most important changes is the possibility for writers, like we have, some of us have done, to publish their work without an agent or a tra traditional publishing house. And we're now very far from the poor quality of the do-it-yourself tools that were available even only five years ago. Also, we are away from the stigma originally attached to self-publishing. In addition, due to the massive layoff in the publishing industry, many agents and editors are now turned into self-employed editors and copy editors, uh, allowing us to hire them if we wish you know, to improve the quality of our work. Book designers can be, I saw many beautiful covers all around, can be hired as well to design professional looking covers. Um, but online tools are also free and lots of uh, uh, public domain things that are now like in terms of, of graphi graphism um, are now in the public domain that you can use for very modest sum. This was my first experience in this, uh, you know, independent publishing and this is what I did for this book. So it really did not cost me a lot because I did everything on my own, uh, only purchasing uh, the, the cover, you know, through a public domain uh, picture that were available. The print of on, on demand is also making, you know, your cost pretty adjustable as well. Um, as for marketing and promotion, I have many friends who are published uh, traditionally with um, amazing book, high quality books, you know, in terms of content and also visual aspect. Um, except for a, a few renowned authors, it is now very clear that the entire marketing and promotion rely